I like to say, it's really easy to find the right answer to the wrong question. And so if you don't spend enough time thinking about that, you know, you're making band-aids when, you know, someone has a virus. Hello, Melina. What an honor to have you with us today. And thank you so, so much for taking the time. You're a superhero, so I am uh, so excited to have a chat. (laughs) Well, thank you for that. I'm honored to be a superhero and glad to be here. (laughs) (laughs) So so for those of you who don't know um, who Melina is, uh, where have you been hiding? Um, You you need to to find out right away. It's absolutely incredible. Um, So Melina is most famous, I think, really probably for running or being the CEO of uh, the, the Brainy business. Uh, which has a ridiculously incredible podcast that's super fantastically famous and lots of people listen to it. So if you haven't listened to it, go and listen to that. Um, and also is the author of a book, which I've just finished reading, which is amazing, called uh, What Your Customer Wants and Can't Tell You. And it's on behavioral economics or behavioral science, I would say. Um, behavioral science and behavioral economics, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It's, uh, we'll get into the book a bit later, but really if you're looking for something that um, explains very easily uh, behavioral science concepts and uses lots lots of examples in plain English with notes of how to use it practically, then this is definitely the book for you. I, I was just telling you earlier before we started this that I really honestly think it's it's the most helpful sort of practical, enjoying, enjoyable book that I've read on behavioral science ever. So congrats. And, it, and it's relatively new, right? Yeah, it came out in May of 2021. So actually, um, you know, just under six months ago from when we're uh, recording now today. So, and that is, uh, you know, no, seeing the the large library of books you have behind you, that, that means a lot that it's uh, one of your favorites. <laughs> It's well, I wish I had a bigger library. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're getting there one day. Um, but yeah, I mean, how did you get into this business? Uh, I mean, you, you, you're because you're now a, also a, a lecturer at um, Texas, is it AM? AM. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. my undergrad is in business administration marketing. And I remember, you know, when I was in school, there was just one like section of one book in one class, just this little tiny thing on buyer psychology. And I thought it was just the most amazing thing in the whole world. And, you know, right then it's like someday when I go back, I'm going to get a master's in this. And I thought it was awesome. And I spent the better part of 10 years calling school across the country, um, and asking for, you know, their programs. And everybody said, that's, that's not a thing that doesn't exist. And so I just, you know, was working and loved my job and was doing some innovation programs and, you know, finding I, I, learning, you know, I think it's clear. I love to learn. So I was finding other programs and things to be part of. And, and I was in this innovation group, kind of like a fellowship for people in this financial space that I was in. And we were at a conference and they brought in some people for us uh, from the Center for Advanced Hindsight at Duke University, which is Dan Ariely's lab and group down there. And I had said, oh, like, it's like, ah, oh, this is what I've been looking for <laughs> for all this time. And so I cornered them and made them tell me everything about uh, behavioral economics. And so I went and found myself a master's program as promised. And then you know, I knew I was early ish because I had spent so much time researching and, you know, school said it wasn't a thing. Um, and, but on the applied side of behavioral economics, behavioral science, I was, didn't realize just how early I was. And there was nobody talking about the stuff that was so obvious to me about how this applied to communications and marketing and brand strategy and for companies to be doing pricing work and all these things. And so, kind of ended up in the, well, I guess I'll start doing that. And, um, you know, the podcast came from there and it was the first behavioral economics podcast, definitely for business. As far as I know, just even like consistent behavioral economics podcast, the first one, which is why it became so popular that anywhere in the world, you would search behavioral economics 
uh, in podcasts and mine would be the first or only one that came up. Wow. So, um, yeah, then with the, the podcast again, about applying things that then got to a lot of people with my consulting that would say like, I get it, but like, I don't know where to start. You talk about it. It makes so much sense. I hear you, but I'm not sure what to do in my own business. Um, and so that, um, is kind of where the book came from. And you said this was early. What, what sort of year is this like? To- yeah, not that, not as early as uh, you would think with the people that you know, I guess. So I started my uh, master's in 2017. So like not, not early in behavioral sciences as a thing, right. but in that applied space and people really talking about applied, it was the right, it was the perfect time. Yeah. And I think, I think it's, it's easy when you're, when you're in that, in, in a specific industry, it's easy to overestimate how popular a subject is. I mean, I think when I chat to friends who are not in in behavioral science or not in or just in other other industries, they've kind of heard about it, but it's it's right. It's sort of a topic that seems to be spoken about, but not necessarily exercised. Um, mm-hmm. And I guess it is tricky to to apply it to to businesses sometimes, or or is it? Um, I mean, how what do you normally? How do you normally go about that sort of thing? Like, is there a trick? Are there some basic uh, questions you can ask yourself or? Yeah, I, I mean, the biggest mistake, as you've seen in the book, the thing that businesses get wrong is starting from the very beginning and not spending enough time considering the problem that you're working on. And so from both my work and then people I've interviewed for my show and for the book and things really kind of across the board, everybody I've talked to says that same thing. It's you need to spend more time thinking about the problem so that you are fixing the right thing. I like to say it's really easy to find the right answer to the wrong question. And so if you don't spend enough time thinking about that, you know, you're making band-aids when, you know, someone has a virus, I guess, you know, like there's no, it doesn't make any positive impact. And when you spend enough time thinking about the problem, the solutions can be very easily presented and you can implement really small changes that can make a huge difference for that business. Uh, The book has just 16 concepts that I think are the most relevant for business and the ones that are easiest to apply, like right off the bat. There are some others that are, there are many, many others others that are really useful, yeah. but yeah. just for someone to get started themselves, this is a really solid kind of tool kit to work with. Yeah, you've got really great examples of sort of priming and scarcity and, and, and all these sorts of things. And I know in that section of the book, you use that, is it Einstein? That was that great quote, wasn't it? Um, I can't remember yeah. if you remember what it was something like if I was oh. given a problem to solve. Yeah. So, uh, reportedly, you know, Einstein was asked if he was given an hour to save the world, how would he spend that hour? And he says he would spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes solving it. And so that's like, I would say yeah. to anyone that's listening, you know, how, if you think about the last problem or project you worked on in business of your relative hour, you know, what's your ratio? How much of your time did you spend thinking about the problem? And in that way, a one hour meeting before you spent hundreds of hours on a project doesn't count. Right? <laughs> it's not, it's not enough. And for most people probably don't even spend five minutes of their hour working on thinking about the problem. You just think, oh, we, we need more customers. Ta-da. Right. And you just like jump into it or like people don't like this flow or our form is bad. That's the problem. Mm-hmm. And you just jump in the, it's too expensive, whatever that thing you think is wrong because it's the first thing that came to your brain. And we're biased to think that we're smarter and better and faster than everybody else. And so you just start working on that and trying to solve okay, something. So it's true, Melina. I mean, you are smart. <laughs> oh. Thank you. <laughs> That's very kind of you to say. Um, yeah. So you go jump in and start working on something that may m- more often than not, like I didn't get into pricing too much in this book. There's a, a future book in, in the series will be dedicated to pricing. Um, but in this case, you know, pricing isn't really about price. It's all the stuff that happens before the price that matters more. Speaking of concepts from your book, there was one 
thing which uh, which I thought was quite interesting that you said you do in your in your own um, for your own podcast and uh, it was around leveraging the power of questions mm -hmm. um, and then uh, in in part of the book you were saying here, every episode of the Brainy Business Podcast ends with me saying, thanks again for listening and learning with me and remember to be thoughtful. So be, be, be thoughtful. Um, and, uh, and it says the phrase be thoughtful, which is also how I close all my emails, have, has most multiple facets. First, the be is intentionally capitalized to represent behavioral economics. The concept of thoughtful is more than meets the eye as well. I just thought um, these kind of doing some of these small things often have such a big Im impact. And uh, I wondered if you wanted to talk a bit more about that or share any other examples of things where. Oh, sure. Yeah. I, that's, you know, understanding the associations that happen within the brain and how we're priming ourselves constantly, whether we think about it or not, makes uh, just such a huge impact. And so that thoughtfulness around a brand and all the little nuances or, uh, you know, in movies or whatever, you know, you talk about them like Easter eggs, right? The little thing that you get to see and you think is so kind of fun and interesting. Uh, another would be be the logo for the brainy business, which is, uh, has a rocket ship that's taking off. And then this, but the smoke under the rocket is shaped like a brain and you don't notice it right away. Right. You have to kind of look, uh, and I have a font that's a little bit, um, squishy, I would say, <laughs> um, that it is kind of brain reminiscent, I guess, would be the way to talk about that. And it's one of those that you look at also, because I know that the topic is such a heavy one. And so much of when people are just starting, they're like, am I going to like this? This seems like it's going to be rough. And hopefully people can tell from here. And like you said, from the book, like I'm, I'm, I try to be fun and lighthearted with stuff. It's not academic. It doesn't feel while it's very academic and there are lots of citations, it doesn't feel like a boring lecture when you're listening to the show, when you're reading the book. And so making sure that the logo and the art has this kind of cartoony fun aspect to it makes you think, you know, I'm going to try this one. If it is next to something else that looks very like stodgy, mm -hmm. then you'd say, well, you know, like maybe I'll go here first, right? <laughs> this is the yeah. first one. So those little bits and knowing what your brand is about and how you need to be tying that in to everything that you do, including, you know, my own sort of like anchor woman sign off, I guess, of uh, remembering to be thoughtful is, uh, is very uh, important for all brands. And I love incorporating that sort of stuff. Yeah. And, the, and there are just so many incredible stories in your in your book and you really have done the hard work um you know you've you've looked at all of these academic studies and and then translated them into really easy and enjoyable short stories really which is kind of a lot of what we try and do with with 42 courses as well so it's uh, it was yeah that was very pleasurable to, to to read and see um are there any other kind of examples from companies that you really admire i know um Perhaps like uh, uh, one of the ones you talk about in the book is Peak End Rule. Um, mm -hmm. Have you got any, can you remember any of those amazing examples <laughs> off the top of your head? Okay, so like like you know? I know now I'm having this like specific Peak End Rule <laughs> company example. What What is coming to mind is something that has to do with surprise and delight, which yeah. is the Bing translator and including Klingon so that they were able to better compete with, um, with Google translate and things like that. And so that was some work that Matt Wallert did while he was at Microsoft. And, you know, when it's something like a translator, what, what's fun about that. Right. And because with, um, surprise and delight, you need this delight comes from not having an expectation of what is to come. And you fully expect that a translator is going to translate things properly. It can't translate something so well that you're going to go out of your way and be like, amazing. It was the greatest translation ever. I'm so excited, right? You know, who cares? I'll be really mad if it's wrong and I go say something and sound stupid uh, where yeah. you're unexpected in there. Um, but you know, what could be delightful 
about that. And so looking to um, work with the Star Trek Into Darkness movie was coming out. And so they decided to create Klingon in the Bing translator and the whole like, like took over the movie premiere and people were able to engage with the brand in a way that was so interesting and really becomes this peak moment for a lot of yeah. people that care about Star Trek that would then be very loyal to Bing as a translator, you know, moving forward because they were asked to be part of that conversation and to be working on everything. Um, so, oh, okay. Another, uh, peak end thing would be Disney. Maybe that's what you were okay. talking about. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, ah, there's so well, many, it's, you know, <laughs> I mean, I think yeah. in, in every great experience, you have a peak, which is kind of something in the middle or right and when you start the experience which you remember and then you want to end with something the end experience has to be really good too and yeah this, this example was lovely I hadn't actually read that one before oh oh great yeah so with Disney is so really knowing what your end point is is important because we would like to think it's you know when someone orders something off of your website and then it's done or whatever that is and so Way back, Disneyland uh, realized and knew that when people left the park was not the end of the experience that they had with Disneyland. It was when they went and took those, you know, ancient things of uh, film and <laughs> went to have them developed. And then you get the photos back and you get to open and look through them all and you like relive the trip and get to show that to everyone and, and whatnot. Um, so in that experience, they then worked with Kodak to figure out the best colors to paint around the park so that the photos that they would take would pop and look amazing. And then you want to share them and it helps this like flood of emotion come back and you love it that you end on this real high versus for any of us that are old enough to remember waiting on and getting photos from a trip and they're all like blurry or kind of green or whatever. And like, faded and doesn't it's just disappointing that's a terrible way to end and so making it so you have this amazing end point can then help that you want to come back again but if you don't understand that true end it can be having such a big impact on your business yeah I guess the modern day equivalent would be probably doing something with Instagram and having a having a yeah sort of some square frame that you can take a picture of as you're leaving that uh, reminds you of the castle in the background or something. Yeah, exactly. We, I was just talking with the client that's um, in um, spirits like alcohol and we were talking about, um, you know, having beautiful cocktails that people want to take a photo of. And then it's, you know, you get home and it's seeing how many likes there are and engaging in the comments that does keep going if you have something that's, you know, grammable, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I get it. Well, I mean, I guess actually it's an interesting thing. We, we're coming up to a very traditional US day, um, which is what, Black Friday? I mean, uh, <laughs> yes, the, yeah, the day after the Thanksgiving. Yeah, now season. it's, yeah, it's like, um, National Shopping Week, I think is what <laughs> it should be called because, you know, you have, uh, Black Friday, which actually starts Thursday. And now some of the um, stores are releasing. I think I saw Walmart is get, letting people know the deals now, even several weeks in advance. And then you have Small Business Saturday. Uh, Cyber, something, Monday. Cyber, Cyber Monday. I was trying to think of what Sunday was. And then Giving Tuesday is to be giving stuff to nonprofits and that there are matches that go with that. So like I said, it's uh, it's spend money week. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> at the yeah. end of th of November. <laughs> but are there any, um, I mean, thinking back on those, are there any, uh, are there any sort of, because a lot of that's to do with framing often, um, uh, apart from the, your sort of, you know, usual, like buy one, get one free, are there any things that you've seen that stuck out that you thought were really pretty fun or interesting or kind of yeah, the like of more, I guess? Well, I, I think what I would actually say in this point is I, I like, I wrote an article for Inc magazine a few years ago that was about not well, uh, you know, black Friday is a really great holiday 
consumer science wise, where it's got the scarcity, the time pressure, uh, loss aversion and FOMO things that come into play that you feel like you, you have hurting, you see everyone else jumping on board and you want to as well. Availability bias, because it's in the news and everybody's talking about the great deals and you don't want to miss out or your kid to miss out, you know, you get, uh, really amped up for it. But as a business, the, we feel often that we need to do something for Black Friday because everyone else is doing it. But that is a herding instinct in and of itself. And so similar to that thoughtfulness that you'd be giving to everything is to say, like, is it actually best for my business to do something as a big deal right now or not? And to know for one, you know, kind of like permission, you don't have to do something when there happens to be big sales happening just because everyone else does, doesn't mean that you have to. Mm -hmm. And actually like the, the other piece on this is like, everyone sends gifts to their clients in December, right? That's okay. like the national international time of sending a gift basket or a card or a little something. And because you're one of everything that's happening at that exact same time, you actually have so much for one, it's like, ugh, just one more card. So it gets kind of tossed off to the side and mm -hmm. you get judged against all what other random gifts other people are giving. So if you just sent a card or you sent something that's not as cool as this amazing gift basket, then it, your effort is totally wasted. Whereas if you would send those things in April or June, and you're the only one sending them fun to do like an anniversary of when they became a client or a partner For sure. right or yeah. when you started the business like it's our yeah. birthday so we're sending you something yeah. uh you know you can really do nice. things at other times of the year and you're more likely to be remembered and to stand out to have that benefit of surprise and delight than if you're just expected that's the same thing with uh expectations people expect to get a whole bunch of random stuff at the holiday and their birthday right? You get the yeah. random thing, like from your dentist that's yeah. saying, Oh, happy birthday. And don't forget to come in to see me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Very sincere. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you can do something at a different time when they wouldn't be expecting it, just send something nice. It will resonate a lot more. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and then I think sort of, uh, yeah, going back to you, you do a lot of consulting as well so um i mean are there any kind of projects that you've been working on recently that, are, that you're allowed to talk about or share that you thought were i so wish i could talk about more things <laughs> that's and this is the the issue with in applied behavioral sciences there's a lot of amazing projects and things that are going on that yeah people just don't talk about because of corporate um <laughs> um, disclosures and things like that. And for competitive advantage and whatnot. Um, so what I will say is that I've been doing a lot of work with, uh, what I call question storming. It's based on a technique by the right question Institute, which is their question formulation technique of being able to help people to find the actual problem, right? To spend more time thinking about the question. And instead of brainstorming, which doesn't really work well with how our brains actually work, yeah. uh, taking time to ask good questions. And so facilitating those sessions, either to start early on to say, what should we even be looking at? Where are we? What matters? What should we be doing? Or then this other piece being, um, when you have a project or you think, you know, what the problem is, or you have a goal, right? So we know that we need more customers or we we're losing, you know, we're slipping in this, you know, space over here, uh, and we don't know what's wrong. Then we can start working and like I say, attack it with questions. And so take something that we think the problem is and start asking a lot of questions about it in this, you know, facilitated fashion to help determine the real problem that then turns into a project that we can put those behavioral interventions in for. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And, and it, it, it's, if anyone does have a business and they're, they're looking to do some consulting, uh, you can get in touch with Melina anytime you want. Her website is thebrainybusiness.com. Um, and then uh, just quickly, what well, I forgot to ask you this earlier, um, you said that um, 
when you first got into into behavioral economics uh it was just you had, you had taken a sort of a, a module or something and then it it it, it really stood out to you and and, uh, and then later again when you were doing uh your your other work and and dan Ariely's sort of team came in um was there a particular story that really caught your attention like what was there was there a hook that really got you into this was there was there or is it just generally the field in general or? um yeah so from that undergrad space I don't remember the book or I remember where I was sitting in the room I remember which instructor right but I don't remember the the specific book uh, but what I do know, so when the team from the Center for Advanced Hindsight came out, one of the studies they were talking about is this gold coin experiment, uh, which was one they did in Kenya, and it was working on um, helping people to save money. And so they had a bunch of different interventions that they used, I think 12 or 18 or something. And they were looking at, you know, people making a commitment saying, yes, I want to save uh, for, you know, your kid to go to school or whatever it is. And there were different, some were getting matching funds. Some got text messages as if they were from the children that were saying like, thanks mom. I, I really appreciate that you care about me enough to save this money. Right. So that kind of guilt factor to help bring you back into why you were doing something. Um, and they had sort of thrown in this idea of a gold coin where you it had numbers around the edge. Um, so it was one through 12 on the one side and 13 through 24 on the other. And then each week that you save, you get to kind of scratch the edge of the coin uh, to, to show that you did that. And the coin itself was the most impactful piece. It People saved more with that than the text messages, than matching funds. And actually, even when the coin was paired with matching funds, it did worse than just the coin as an incentive on its own. And this like act of marking off and like the gamification of wanting to make sure you go through the process. And so I actually, my master's thesis research project, I worked with a financial institution in uh, the States is probably the easiest way to say here, the, um, to do a six month saving programs. And because, you know, in the U S it's not like people are carrying around gold coins. So that doesn't, mean much of anything. Um, right. Yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't remember and, and whatnot. And even an app doesn't have, you can delete those notifications and whatnot and hide that or whatever, but a uh, refrigerator magnet is mm -hmm. what I ended up using. And that was, um, Dan Ariely was very kind and had a conversation with me while I was a lowly master's student to talk about his project and, uh, some options and, um, that he might have done if he was going to continue the study. And so I went forward and went with the refrigerator magnet that had the, it says like scratch if you saved, it has a picture with a big pile of money on it and you claim your goal and whatnot. And so in that six months, um, the group that had the magnet saved more and had higher, um, they use NPS scores, net promoter score, uh, than the other two groups. So oh. those who were prompted to save in the same exact way, but didn't have the magnet and just a control group. Wow. Uh, that'd be amazing. I love it. The way that it's often these totally random things that you would never normally expect to try that often are the things that succeed the most. Yeah. I think it's one of the reasons why I love behavioral science too, is it's, it's often these wacky creative things and, and quite often they're not massively expensive things uh but mm -hmm. that, that, that end up nudging people to do hugely beneficial things for their lives or for their future yeah lives. yeah mm -hmm. oh that actually made me think of actually a client story i can share that is in the book which is from a financial institution that had a new checking account and they were super excited to have on all their billboards uh that you can earn 1.26 percent apy on up to twenty five thousand dollars in balances which means wow. nothing to anyone <laughs> and i got them to you know reframe it to be did your checking account pay you 315 dollars last year it's Amazing. the same count it's the same numbers it means but it actually means something to your brain right. and you can very quickly say no it didn't and who the heck is talking about that right you are now curious and want to go learn more versus feeling like 
I think brands so often feel like they need to get like, Hey, 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 look at this. Mm -hmm. Ah, Like you're trying to entice them where if you just ask a good question, you can get people interested. So that reframe, they ended up having from the same media buy they were planning on doing, and they ended up with a 60% month over month growth in new account openings. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. And I'd imagine the same is true for uh, credit cards and things like that. I mean, they're they're normally terrible with the sort of millions of different types of percentages that they show. I mean, it's it's so hard to figure out, even if you're a (laughs) smart person. I spent six years running a marketing department for a financial institution. And a lot of my clients are in that space as well. And that's, I kind of like to joke that if I can make checking accounts sexy, you know, you can (laughs) sell anything, right? (laughs) (laughs) It's uh, it's amazing. But um, I know we're probably like running out of time a bit, but um, I guess kind of to close, um, I think the best thing, the best advice I could give to anyone listening is go and buy your book. Um, and I know <laughs> Melina very kindly said that if you're a uh, if you're a listener to this podcast, um, you can have a sneak peek at the first chapter. Um, so we're going to create a uh, a URL, <laughs> which I don't know yeah. you know what that URL will be. <laughs> yes, yes, I do. It's it'll be so people can go to thebrainybusiness.com slash forty two, and that'll be the numbers four two. Um, and it's, uh, waiting there for you. You can get the first chapter of the, of what your customer wants and can't tell you for free. Thank you so much. And if, if, uh, if you can't wait, and I highly recommend that you can't wait, um, just go to any bookstore or Amazon, if you have access to it and, uh, and search either for Melina Palmer and you'll find her book or, uh, what your customer wants and can't tell you, and uh, you'll be able to find it there too. And um, is there a way, uh, the best way to get in touch with chat in touch with you? Is, <laughs> is it Twitter or, uh, or I guess on your website as well as a contact form? Yeah. Yes. To all of those, um, on all the socials, pretty much you can find me as the brainy biz B I Z. And you can also, uh, LinkedIn is great. And I have mindset that you can actually connect with me versus having to follow and things like that. So you can just find Melina Palmer on LinkedIn. Uh, the brainy business is there too. Um, or yeah, the brainy business.com or the brainy biz on most of the other socials. It's amazing. Thank you so, so much for taking the time and sharing some of these incredible stories and, and bravo with everything you're doing. I, yeah, absolutely in awe and, and well done. Uh, bravo on being you. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm really looking you. forward to, to chatting again soon. And um, yeah, hopefully uh, we can get you on one of our courses sometime soon. Uh, yeah, I know there's, sounds great. Sure there's some more behavioral science stuff that we're going to do shortly. So um, we'll be in touch. But thank you so, so much, Kevin. Really, really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for having me.